So network tapping. Um, I assume most people are somewhat familiar with tapping or, you know, it's pretty self-evident from the name. You're tapping into your network and getting a copy of packets out and putting them into Zeek, which is simple and easy, right? Well, reality is somewhat more complicated. Um, but actually, it's, it's not that bad. Um, I do think the concept of tapping is very simple and very easy, uh, but you can do some cool and, and kind of interesting and more complicated things with it. Um, but you do have to look out for some of the pitfalls. So before I talk about actual physical taps, I wanted to mention some technologies um, that go by multiple names, mirror ports or monitor sessions, span ports. Um, but I think of them as all basically on-device packet replication. So you have a switch or a router, and it's running something that is copying packets from one interface to another interface. And that has some pros and cons to it. So it's usually free. You can just go and configure it on a switch or a router, and you're off to the races. Um, you can do filtering at the source. So if you only care about seeing SMTP traffic or VoIP traffic or web traffic, you can apply a filter, and then you don't even have to worry about sending it off to your, your Zeek nodes. It's also non-disruptive, generally, to just go and configure it. Um, you know, if you want to enable it, you just you can go and do that right away, and you're done. Um, and then if you're using RSpan or Lawful Intercept, you can send it to a remote location over in-band channels. But because it is in-band, uh, you risk resource contention. So if your switcher router is heavily loaded, if it is you know, getting DOSed, it may not be able to service that packet replication. And so you may not actually be able to see what's going on in order to prevent it or stop it. Um, you, you kind of also run into hardware limitations at times. So some things, some models will only let you do, say, two span ports per device or per line card. And then you also risk running into oversubscription. So you know, let's say you've got a one gig port and you want to see every single packet on that interface. Um, that means you need to see one gig transmit and one gig receive, which is two gigabits per second. And if your router or switch only has one gig ports, you know, what do you do there? So that's where something like a tap comes in. And a tap is a separate piece of physical equipment that you install in line on a link between two devices rather than just running it on one of the devices. And there are all kinds of taps, right? So there are active taps, passive taps, copper taps, so Cat5e, Cat6a, or fiber taps as well. And we're big fans of, of fiber taps, especially the passive fiber taps, because they've been very reliable for us. Um, you don't have to worry about them being powered, so you can install them places that don't have power, or if you don't want the power going out in that place to cause problems for your link. Um, and then, you know, because it's all light, there's no oversubscription. You're just, you know, you are getting two pieces of fiber out of that tap. You have to plug into two different interfaces, but you're not worrying about dropping packets. So on the downsides, though, they are kind of expensive. So it's not just a free configuration item on your switcher router. You're spending a couple hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars per tap. Now, compared to a hundred gig port on a big expensive edge router, you know, it costs you tens of thousands of dollars per port. Maybe that's not that bad. But the thing that is hard to get around is they're disruptive, right? So you're installing them in line on a link. You've got to disconnect that fiber in order to plug in your tap. So um, one of the first pitfalls you can run into with fiber is um, understanding the link, understanding the connectors that you have. Um, the most common ones in data centers these days are LC and MPO. Um, the types of fiber that you have, is it single mode or is it multi-mode? And you can get like really into the weeds with this. You know, is it UPC or APC connectors if it's LC? Is it a type A or a type B connector if it's MPO? Do you have OM3 or OM4 for your multi-mode fiber? And then you have even more obscure things like understanding your light levels on a path. Um, so for example, you're transmitting light from one end to the other. The far end has a received signal strength threshold for which it can actually detect light and bring up the link. Um, and you're losing light at every uh, connector point along that path. So if you have five patch panels, you're losing light at each one. If it's a kilometer in you know, one of those spans, you're losing light on that. And if you're right at that threshold and you go to install a tap, taps are, you know, they're splitting light off in order to uh, provide light to Zeek. Um, you know, they're sold as like 50-50 or 70-30 or 80-20 split ratios. If you're right at that threshold, it can drop you below that threshold and then your production link doesn't come up. 
And then there are other things that can affect whether you know, your, your light, uh, you're getting enough light on that far end, things like bend radius or fiber cleaning. And there are actually um, even, even stranger things that can happen with, with dirty fiber. So actually I was thinking um, supercomputing 2015, I think we ran into an issue with a 100 gig link that would come up, it had good, good light levels, um, and you could do a 10 gig performance test across it, no problem, but when you try to do 100 gig over it, it would be dropping packets all over the place. And the theory that we had, because um, we went and cleaned that fiber and reseeded the connector and it, it worked fine after that, the theory we had was that it couldn't keep up, or the, the error correction couldn't keep up from all the errors that it was generating, so it was causing it to drop packets only at those higher uh, bandwidths. So, um, so those are some things with taps. Uh, now you have a bunch of taps and you wanna go and feed them into Zeek. You could go and plug them directly into Zeek nodes, you know, just like one interface out of a tap into a Zeek node, but that doesn't scale real well, right? So when you have tens or hundreds of links that you're tapping, um, it may make sense to do something like feed it into tap aggregation, uh, or also known as network packet brokers. So, these are basically layer two switches that are capable of doing things that are more than layer two switching. So you can aggregate a bunch of interfaces into a single traffic stream. Uh, you can apply a filter to that traffic stream. You can replicate it across multiple output interfaces if you wanna send it to different tools. Or you can do something like load balance it across multiple interfaces going to a Z cluster. Um, and so you can do this all in one device now. Uh, when we actually started using this vendor of switch, you couldn't do it in one device. They had a model that could do 40 gig and 100 gig aggregation, but it couldn't do the more rich features like filtering and load balancing across uh, port channel. And actually we found, uh, we've, we've kind of kept this separate model now, even though we can do it in a single one, um, because there are cool things you can do like having a completely unadulterated stream of traffic that you send to like a core light sensor um, that doesn't need to have that filtering in advance. So um, I had mentioned you can do load balancing across a port channel to a Z cluster. Uh, this is some example config in the particular vendor uh, switch that we have. Um, so a normal port channel and networking, uh, it can just like spray packets across those interfaces. Um, you know, it'll do packet one in a connection down interface one and packet two down interface two problem with that is you've got different Zeek nodes on that far end, and it's no longer seeing like packets in a connection, so it's, it's going to have trouble reassembling that connection. Um, so what you can do is you can configure a policy or a profile to say this is the criteria I want the switch to use to decide which interface to send all the packets for a connection down. So you can do like a five tuple, for example. And then on the far end, um, when, Zeek, when your Zeek node receives that traffic, um, you know, it might be getting a 10 gig stream of, you know, traffic from the tap ag switch, and you don't really wanna send that all to a single worker. Um, so what you can do is you can spread, you can fan out that traffic across multiple workers um, that are then uh, pegged to CPUs. Um, so when you zoom out, what you have is you've got your tap links feeding into your tap ag infrastructure where you're doing aggregation and filtering and distribution across a cluster, and then within the Zeek nodes in a cluster, you're fanning it out across multiple worker processes. So you can have like a 50 gig per second stream of traffic in your production network, or you know, it's, it's multiple connections, but in aggregate, it's 50 gigabits per second, that then goes to a cluster and is spread across 50 different workers. So um, what does this look like in reality? Uh, this is kind of a cartoonized version of our network um, we've got our external peers at the top and then they connect to our border routers and between those two we have what we call our external DMZ taps. And then between our border routers and our internal routers or subnet gateways, we have a layer of taps called our internal DMZ. And then downstream of our internal routers, we have our layer two devices, our switches, wireless controllers, VPN concentrators. And we've got a layer of taps between those. We call our intra taps or like intranet. Uh, it basically looks at traffic within our network. So those taps all feed into tap ag infrastructure, and we have kind of three, yeah, three different, maybe four different environments for tap ag. 
Um, this one is our primary external DMZ tap ag. So we feed the taps into our aggregation layer. It's two models of switches, one that does one gig and 10 gig aggregation, because that's all it has. Uh, I guess it has like a handful of 100 gig ports, but you can't do a, a dense 100 gig on it. And then we have the dense 40 gig and 100 gig aggregation. And so we feed those, feed the one 10 gig into the 40 gig, 100 gig, and we feed those out to our output layer uh, where we're doing like ACLing and uh, load balancing. So then redundant to that, we have a separate physical location that we kind of run a, a similar or, or like almost identical tap ag infrastructure, except we collapse some of that functionality because we're super space constrained in that location. Um, so the one gig and 10 gig aggregation is actually the same model of switch as we're doing for output. So we just do that in one unit. Um, and then actually it's fed from a separate physical tap so that if we lose power in the main location, if the building burns down, we've still got everything running in our secondary location. Uh, we just install two taps in line, which is kind of a challenge because you gotta make sure that light level is still sufficient on that far end. If you're installing two 50-50 taps, you're potentially dropping it more than 25%. Um, so then the int DMZ and the intra tap, uh, that feeds into a single tap ag infrastructure um, where again, we're doing an aggregation layer and an output layer, but we are being a little bit more clever with how we um, kind of group or tag our interfaces. So we have two different streams of traffic. We've got the int DMZ that is looking at traffic between our network and the outside world, and we apply a filter for that. And we've got the intra uh, stream of traffic that's only looking at like traffic within our network for lateral movement detection. Um, and so we can feed those to two different Zeeks, but it's all within the same infrastructure. So um, ACLs, I had mentioned, you know, you can do filtering, you can do that with access control lists. Um, one of the reasons you may want to do that is to protect tools that can't do high bandwidth analysis, for example. So, We've got one, it does malware analysis, but if you pay for a 10 gig interface, it can really only do two and a half to like five gigabits per second of analysis. So we apply ACLs at the very start. We accept what we call control packets. It's for TCP connections, that's SYN, PIN, reset, UDP packets. We just accept them all at the moment. Um, we also accept the fragments and GRE and ICMP. Basically the packets that you need in order to see a connection start and finish. Um, but then we drop uh, payloads of protocols or applications that we know are going to spin up super fast. They're gonna go to 10 gigabits per second or 40 gigabits per second like as soon as they start. And that includes Perf Sonar, which is a network performance monitoring application, and XRoot D, which is like a distributed file transfer application. We, we know we're not going to analyze the payload of that anyway, um, so we just, we don't even bother sending it. Uh, and then we also drop encrypted things where we get the unencrypted traffic in other places. And this is an example of what a static ACL looks like in the particular vendor that we use. So it's just, it's got a sequence number, the action, permit or deny, and then whatever criteria you're setting, right? You're, it's TCP for this given port or uh, address range. But can you do better than that? So you, you don't always know exactly what you know, IP address or port number you're going to need to, to filter out, and you can't always wait for an engineer to go log into a switch. So we're using something uh, called shunting or dynamic ACLing. Um, basically, it uses Zeek to identify those connections which uh, match a certain criteria. So for example, it could be as simple as if it's over 100 megabytes, trigger an elephant flow, basically, or identify it as an elephant flow trigger this action that uses Dumno, which um, Justin wrote, uh, basically interacts with the API on the switch to dynamically add an ACL based on the five tuple. Um, and so you get this feedback loop of you know, traffic going into Zeek. Zeek says, this is too big of a flow. I don't wanna see the rest of this payload. Trigger an ACL and drop the rest of that traffic. And that's an example of what a dynamic ACL looks like. So it's still, it's accepting those control packets at the start. So you see the, the session initiation and the termination, but then it has those, the payload uh, rules that it's dropping. Um, so some more interesting things you can do with, with tapping and tap ag. So kind of when you get started with, with tapping, you might go and install one tap and that gets you some visibility, but you miss out on other visibility. Um, so the next thing you do is you go and you install more taps. 
um, and that's great. That gets you the visibility you were missing, but now all of a sudden you're getting multiple copies of packets. So for example, if you're looking at internal traffic between A and E here in that center diagram, you're getting three copies of packets as it crosses three tabs. So um, you know, one way to approach that is you could pay for packet deduplication in whatever you know, packet broker you have. Um, ours doesn't support that, and so what we have to do is be more selective and say, okay, we're gonna send traffic from one tap to our DMZ and one tap to our intra Zeek cluster, um, but then what you can actually do is say, okay, for um, a given path of traffic, uh, as long as we're getting both directions from some taps, uh, we don't need to get both directions from all taps. So the example of that is the intra Zeek. We have a tap between like the layer two switch and the router, and we can send traffic from that one direction to the intra Zeek, and then we don't have that similar tap in a different location, you know, it's a remote location, but we do have it one link up between the two routers. And so we can say, pull traffic out of that direction and send it to the intra -Zeek. And what you end up getting effectively is a single tap on that entire path. And then um, if you were in Ashish's talk yesterday about zero trust, he had shown a diagram about how we're tapping email. Um, this, you know, what we used to do in the olden days I don't know, two years ago, three years ago, was we had an on-prem SMTP relay. We were doing unencrypted SMTP. You just put a tap in front of it. There you go, you get email. Um, but we had a project move the SMTP relay up to the cloud and start doing encryption, you know, doing start TLS. So we lose visibility in Zeek with both of those. And so our approach was to enable something called dual delivery in the cloud SMTP relay that basically just says, every message for your domain, in or out, send a copy of it to this IP address. And that IP address is just a server running Nginx, it terminates TLS, and then strips off the encryption and sends it through another fiber link, uh, just another interface in it, or in that server, that goes through a tap, and then uh, it plugs into another interface that is running SMTP sync, I think in a FreeBSD jail, that just like dev nulls that packet. But because it crosses that tap, we can take the output of it and shove it into our existing tap bag, and Zeek is none the wiser. It's just, it's seen unencrypted SMTP again. So um, there are a whole lot of topics about tapping and tap bags. So for the sake of time, I haven't included them in this presentation, but they're in the appendix. There's like 16 slides there. Um, and of course, you know, if you have questions here, feel free to ask me or you can hit me up on Slack or send us an email. Um, my last name is kind of hard to spell, but you can send it to security at lbl.gov and uh, myself or somebody else on that list will uh, help you out. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Do we have questions? It's a fairly simple question. Um, for modern architectures, when using um, software-defined networking and essentially fabric uh, interconnects, whether it's physical, virtual, cloud, whatever, hybrid, uh, where do you see a place for dynamic tapping for individual ports? Because you can VXLAN them anywhere. Right, yeah. So we have started having discussions with our networking group uh, about that because they would very much like to do VXLAN. Um, I think what it comes down to is making intelligent decisions about where you want to tap in your network. Um, you know, so the example that they gave is we want to do uh, VXLAN between two scientific devices in different buildings. Um, and so we wouldn't have visibility into that necessarily. The question is do we, do we care about seeing that visibility? If we have some higher upstream tap, um, can we see the ingress point into the attack? Um, or can we be abusive of VXLAN and force all traffic through a tap point? Um, we haven't really decided yet, so. <laughs> uh, but it is, it is certainly a challenge, and especially when you start talking about cloud um, resources. Uh, we have a little bit of a test right now in AWS uh, where we're doing network um, mirroring in AWS to a Zeek instance running in AWS. What'll be interesting is can we apply that at scale when everybody in our organization can just, just go spin up their own AWS instance uh, to be determined, I guess. <laughs> Other questions? Mm 
Okay. Maybe yeah. so. I find it, find it always exciting to see how you guys are scaling up over the years. So, so you, you seem to be always hitting like limits and then, then uh, going beyond limits that used to be there. Um, is there any capability that you're really missing right now? Anything where you would say, oh, if only my, I don't know, aggregation switches could be doing X, Y, Z? Well, uh, it, it's not super exciting, but we are looking at 400 gig, um, and nobody is really selling 400 gig tap ag switches that I know, I guess like, okay, there is one vendor that's doing it. Um, I don't know of anybody who has in production. If anybody is running 400 gig tap ag, I would like to talk to you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you.